I'm Alan Combs. I want to welcome to our microphones Jamin Shively. Uh, he is behind an effort to uh, bring to the state of Washington premium marijuana. Is that correct, uh, Jamin? And you are also a former Microsoft manager, a uh, executive at Microsoft. An interesting career choice for you, huh? Thank you very much, Alan. And first of all, I want to say it's an honor to be on your show. I've uh, enjoyed watching you all these years on Fox, and uh, it's kind of hard to believe I'm actually talking with you. I know. So it's thank a, you for it's having a, it's me a, on. Uh, it must be a real thrill for you. No, I'm just kidding. I, 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 <laughs> but, uh, no, thank you. I appreciate those kind words. Well, tell me what you're doing. So you've got an interesting – I mean, there you are, a big deal at Microsoft, and now uh, you've totally made a career change based on the legalization of marijuana in your state, right? That, that, that's exactly right. And uh, it's, it's a really interesting story. Um, so uh, I've actually got marijuana in my blood, so to speak. My, uh, <laughs> gr- <laughs> my great-grandfather uh, was a Spaniard, Diego Pellicer. And as a young man, he went off to uh, the Philippines, as many young men uh, in Spain did of that era. And that's the name of your company, by the way. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, um, and... Uh, so he went off to uh, the island of Cebu uh, in the Philippines, which was part of the Spanish Empire at the time, and he became uh, vice governor of the island of Cebu. And, he, and over time, he became the largest grower of hemp in the world. And uh, so I've, I've always had that legacy. So I've always kind of had hemp on the brain, uh, thanks to my great-grandfather, uh, Diego. <laughs> And uh, you, you've honored him by naming your company after him. And what? tell me what led you to uh, make this uh, particular career path where certainly the legalization in your state has a lot to do with it, but what made you decide to capitalize on that in the way you will talk about in a moment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Alan. So so three, three main reasons. Um, number one, uh, you know, I had grown up uh, thinking that marijuana is somehow bad for you. And, you know, I grew up in the area era of Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan, just say no. And right. I thought, well, there must be a very good reason to say no. And I didn't, hadn't really looked into any of the evidence. And so um, a, a very good friend of mine, colleague at Microsoft, uh, did a bunch of research on it and came to the conclusion, he came to the conclusion that, some t- that in the next five to ten years, marijuana will actually come to be regarded as a health food. Uh-huh. And yeah. so that completely blew my mind. And I, I did the research myself, uh, found out that it is absolutely safe. It is not toxic at all, even in very large quantities. What about the fact you're inhaling into your lungs like you would a cigarette? Uh, can that be good for you? Um, actually, well, breathing in smoke of any kind is, yeah. in, in and of itself is not good. Right. Um, tobacco is extremely harmful. Oh, yeah. Uh, they've, they've done studies and found that people who smoke marijuana but don't smoke tobacco actually do not have an increased uh, risk of lung cancer over non-smokers, people who don't smoke anything. Um, and in fact, there's, if anything, there's a slight tendency in the opposite direction. So what, what's, what's amazing is that smoking marijuana is actually nowhere near as harmful as smoking tobacco. But you've decided to take this to a level that you want to be the uh, gold... Uh What's the word? I guess the Cadillac or the, uh, the you want to be a very high end marijuana dealer, basically, correct? Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so, did you do market research? Did you do any? You you you're going to be you have, want to be a niche within a niche product. Th- that's that's exactly right. And yeah. so so here's the thing, Alan. You've got you've got a lot of uh, first time users or people who will become first time users when it's actually legal to purchase the product. So. Uh, Right now in the state of Washington, it's legal to possess, it's legal to consume in privacy, but there is no legal way to actually go and purchase it. So when it becomes legal for us to open up our stores in the state of Washington and in the state of Colorado uh, and other states as, as they become legal, uh, you're going to have a whole lot of first-time users, and uh, as well as, as, as baby boomer folks who maybe used it 30 years ago, and, uh, and you know, then they got busy. Right got married, had kids, and it simply wasn't the responsible thing to do. But now that it's legal, they can kick up their heels and actually enjoy it. Um, so the, uh, so if you're, if you're going to be trying a product for the first time or for the, for, or for the first time in several decades, uh, you want to get the very best product that you can. And yeah. so I believe that although it's a niche market, as you, as you correctly point out, it's also uh, – 
I believe, going to be a huge market. Because let's face it, we're an affluent society, and as right. Americans, we, we generally try to get the best quality right. products. And if you're can. making an interesting point that if you are a new user, you want to have the best experience possible. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, where will your <laughs> weed come from? How will you? Where will you get the best of the best? So, all of the product that we're going to sell in the state of Washington will be grown in the state of Washington, and likewise, all the product that we will sell in Colorado will be grown in Colorado. And the, now, that's by the, the respective state laws. Now, once it becomes legal uh, nationwide, then there'll be a lot. I, I presume that there will be uh, a lot less restrictions on, on intrastate uh, trade. What of marijuana. will make your marijuana better than anybody else's? So th- there are several factors. Number one is in the actual uh, strain of the product, the actual variety of the of the uh, the marijuana plant itself. There are dozens upon dozens of different varieties. And botanists over the decades have crossed, you know, an Afghan variety uh, with a Thai variety, and they've created all these exotic different strains. Right. And different strains have different properties. Some of them are great for, you know, having a, a really good creative burst. Others are great for just mellowing out and, you know, going to sleep yeah. and, and everything in between. And so um, finding exactly the right strains to provide the experiences that our customers are looking for is absolutely crucial. And then, but strain is just the beginning, just like, you know, having good, if you're a human, if you've got good genes, does that guarantee you're going to have a good life? Obviously not. The way that you're, the way that you're raised, nurture, is extremely important. And so uh, a lot of the growers out there are so passionate about their craft. They're, they're literally artisans yeah. at uh, caring for their plants, the nutrients, the water. Some of them right. even play classical music uh, to their now, plants. What about the legal hurdles that have to be overcome before you can actually do business? It's recreational uh, pot legal, but you can't sell it. You can't, you know, that, there's still all kinds of legal issues. So how do you get to that place? Right, right, right. So uh, that is a real, that's, that's the $100 billion question, Alan. And I say $100 billion because it's going to be a $100 billion <laughs> industry across the United States. Right. Um, so you've got the feds that have, you know, they don't want to look weak. They don't want to come across as like, oh, we're just going to, you know, capitulate. So they, right. I, I think the federal government feels an obligation to do, to do something and not just, you know, uh, roll over. On the other hand, the states uh, have spoken loud and clear, Washington and Colorado, for starters. Yeah. A lot of other states are working on their own initiatives right now. Right. Um, so the states have their rights. And there's, there's a really interesting constitutional uh, question of whether this is a state's rights issue or a federal government sure. has the right to impose. And, um, but I simply look at history, and you look back in the days of Prohibition, where, where do a side-by-side comparison, alcohol is physically addictive. Marijuana yeah. is not physically addictive. Alcohol is right. No, I understand all the arguments, but, but still, yeah. there's still there are legal issues, and how do you know they'll be solved in such a way that will enable you to do business? Well, I, if you if you simply look at the parallel again with with prohibition, leaving aside the side by side comparison with with alcohol, back in the days of prohibition, nobody said, "Hey, you know, alcohol is a great thing, and it's great that all these people are messing up their lives with alcohol." But people realized over time that the laws criminalizing alcohol we're doing right. a lot more harm than the alcohol. So you just think people will come to their senses and it'll eventually be legal. We're just on a, on a train that's not going to go in the opposite direction at this point. You, you have said it perfectly, Alan. Right. That's we're, exactly we have it. a little, just short on time here, but I want to get in a call if we can. Doug in Seattle with uh, Jamin Shively. Go ahead, Doug. You know, I'm just curious, simple question. Do you think, Mr. Shively, that uh, harder drugs like cocaine and heroin are going to go up or down in price as a result of legalization of marijuana. And I'll take my answer. All right, Doug, thank you. What do you say, uh, Jamin? That's a really interesting question. So I'll give you my view on it, right? So we've got this whole population of drug dealers out there, which we have largely created by making marijuana illegal. Right. And so you've got all these, these, these drug dealers selling marijuana, and that's you know maybe 70% of their business in typical cases. And then once they've got a clientele that they're selling all this marijuana to and you know, making their bread and butter, and they see they can make really fat margins on cocaine and heroin, you know, maybe they'll go to their customer and say, hey, you know, 
try the, try this cocaine. I just got some of this stuff in here. Here's a free sample, right? And then and there begins the slippery slope. If you take away the platform of marijuana from those criminal drug pushers, they yeah. no longer have the platform from which they can introduce uh, much more harmful drugs, cocaine and heroin, et cetera, to those uh, clients. We completely eliminate that base. But you don't really eliminate it totally till all drugs are legal, right? Well, here's the thing. I actually don't think all drugs should be completely legal. Um, marijuana is a very special case because it's absolutely harmless. Cocaine, uh, methamphetamine, but you're, but you're still gonna have dealers. You're still going to have dealers for that stuff who will make it on a black market, right? You know, th that's a really interesting question. So for my argument of the last couple of minutes, thanks to uh, the gentleman Doug's question, right. uh, I think we're going to drive – you're going to see a lot fewer – drug dealers, and you're, gonna, you're just going to be left with a much smaller population doing a much more dangerous business. Hmm. Um, right. and, and I think there are other solutions for, for cocaine and, and heroin ad, um, addicts. Uh, that might be a different topic for a right. different night. Well, listen, I appreciate but, having you on, Jamin. It's Jamin Shively, and the company is uh, Diego Pacer. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, Payser, that's correct. Payser. Diego Payser. Uh, Alan, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure right. and an honor to be on your show. Thanks for your time, sir.